we have, in this course, in the exercises and in lectures, uh, been discussing models, models of uh, phylogeny uh, in many different contexts. And I've been trying to stress the idea that a mathematical model of a system is really just a stringently phrased hypothesis about a system. Uh, we have also looked at the process known as model fitting, where we have some particular model with some particular parameters, and we then use model fitting to find good approximates, good estimates of the parameter, best parameter values in that model, for instance, the slope and intercept of line. In this lecture, we will start thinking about how to compare different types of models. And to do that, I will start out by uh, going over this example of, of modeling that, that uh, we have also looked at in, for instance, a previous exercise. So imagine that we have some collected some data from some experimentals, from some system that we're looking at, uh, that gives us some x and y values we can show in a scatter plot like this. It might, for instance, be the uh, blood sugar level and the resulting expression uh, of some gene, the mRNA level of some gene, maybe insulin or, or whatever. So under all circumstances, we're looking at the system and we're collecting data and, and it's, it uh, shows this uh, relationship between the x and the y values. So a reasonable hypothesis about these data, it seems, is that there's a roughly linear relationship, which expressed in the form of a mathematical model, a mathematical equation, is this, y equals b times x plus a. This is a simple model with two parameters, the slope b and the intercept a. Once we have such a model, and once we have estimates of B and A, we can use that to make predictions for unseen values. So we could say, for instance, okay, what do I believe the Y value is for this particular X value? I just plug it into the formula with the values of B and A that I found, and then I can predict this one. I could then compare that to new data, and that would maybe tell me uh, how good my model was. How is it that we find estimates of parameter values? Well, the thing we need in order to find good parameter estimates, the thing we need in order to do model fitting, is we need a measure of how well any given model fits the data that we have. In the case of scatter data like this, and as you saw in the previous exercise, a measure we often use is the sum of squared errors, the sum of squared residuals. The idea is quite simply that we take the y value of the model, which is represented by this line, and subtract the y, the y value of each data point. So if the line has for this particular x value this y value and the data point has this value, we subtract one from the other and square it. That way we all, always have incidentally a positive number for each of these terms. Then we do the same for all the remaining data points, the value on the model, the value on the line here, minus the value on the data point and square that difference. Do that for all of these and sum up these squared terms. This is a measure of how well our model fits the data. And you can see that if the line goes through every single data point, then the difference will in each case be zero and the sum of squared errors, the sum of squared residuals will also be zero. When that's not possible, then the goal instead becomes to find the parameter values that minimizes this sum of squared errors. That's what your pocket calculator does when it does linear regression it is in fact minimizing the sum of squared uh, residuals like this. And maybe the best parameter estimates are 0.95 and minus 0.26, like in this example. So how about phylogeny? Well, as we've discussed in the case of phylogeny, the way that the, the type of model we have is a probabilistic model, meaning a model where we can, for any possible data set, compute the probability of that data set. In the case of likelihood analysis, the measure we have of how well a model fits the data is called the likelihood. And as we've discussed, the likelihood of some model, the likelihood of some parameter values, is the same as the probability of the data you've actually seen given that model, given those particular parameter values. In maximum likelihood, the best set of parameter values are those that maximizes the likelihood, that maximize the probability of the data you have given uh, those parameter values. As we discussed in the case of phylogeny, I'm just uh, reminding you of this so you can understand the context here. In the case of phylogeny, our data set is an alignment. Our model is a model of how one sequence has evolved into the set of present day sequences. Parameters include the tree shape, branch lengths, nucleotide frequencies, 
and nucleotide nucleotide substitution rates. You compute likelihood of an alignment according to the recipe that you've tried yourself in previous exercises, one column at a time, where you have to sum over all possible ancestral uh, sets of, of nucleotides. This gives you the overall probability of one column. You then repeat for the other columns and multiply to get the overall probability of your entire alignment, the overall likelihood. So, in case of maximum likelihood phylogeny, the way that you find good parameter values, you start with the sequence alignment, you start in a random place in the parameter space, you can then start walking around that in a way so that you constantly optimize, maximize the likelihood until you find a, an optimum. At this point, you'll have your maximum likelihood estimate of tree topology. You'll also have your maximum likelihood estimate of the other parameters like branch lengths and substitution rates, etc. But also, and we didn't discuss that much previously, you will have a measure of how well your model fits the data, how well the best model fits the data, and that is the likelihood. So the maximized likelihood at the peak here is a measure of how well this particular model fits your data. In exactly the same way, that the sum of squared errors is a measure of how well this line fits these data points. So, the thing I'd like to discuss in this lecture is we, we know now how we can use this as a way of fitting a particular model. If we assume that there's a linear relationship between x and y in this case, we can use uh, model fitting here to find the best estimates of our parameters. We can find the smallest sum of squared errors, uh, the, the parameters that give us that, and that will be, in some sense, the best line. We could do the same for maximum likelihood. We could, for a given substitution model, Jukes and Cancer, for instance, find the uh, branch links, etc., etc., that gives us the highest likelihood for this particular alignment. But how about if we want to compare different types of models? So, one thing was here that we assumed there was a linear relationship, but how about if we instead assume there's a polynomial relationship like the one I've tried to sketch on this slide? If we have a sufficiently large polynomial, then we might actually make a line that goes through every single data point or almost through every single data point. So this model will have a very good fit. It might, in the, if we have sufficiently many parameters, we can actually get a fit where we have zero sum of squared errors. We have the perfect fit every single point is hit by the line. Should we then choose the polynomial? Is that a better model? Well, intuitively you will probably agree that that's not the case. So these scatter data, they seem to be capturing uh, some underlying relationship between x and y that does seem to be roughly linear. There's a roughly linear relationship as x increases, so does y. And the prediction that we've made based on the line, you would probably think that that's a good prediction unlike the one you would make from the polynomium, which would give you quite a different value. Why is it you believe that? Well, probably what you're seeing here is some underlying regularity. As you increase blood sugar, you also increase uh, expression of the mRNA, for instance. And on top of that, you're seeing some noise. That noise can be uh, uh, originating from measurements, maybe. For instance, it's difficult to precisely measure mRNA, and if you have several parallel uh, test tubes, then you might have not normalized correctly for the number of cells, etc., etc. There are many aspects which will give you uh, a measurement uh, error uh, like this, and that will cause scatter points to, to be fluctuating slightly along uh, or outside the underlying regular uh, relationship. This means that this model has few parameters. It sort of captures the essential relationship in a good way. It's a good description but the fit is not so good. It doesn't actually go through any a single data point. On the other hand, this model, which has seven parameters, many more parameters, is a poor description. It doesn't actually capture the, what we assume here to be the underlying reality, the underlying regularity, but instead it actually uh, it has a very good fit, but it does that by actually fitting the noise, so to speak. We could take this to one extreme. I, I mean, the extreme example would be to have a parameter per data point, and your model would simply be a list of data points. That is, of course, not telling us anything about underlying regularities or, or reasons for, for relationships in the same way that this would be, and it would not allow us to make predictions at all. So it turns out that for nested models, models where one model is sort of a subset of the other model, as in this case, in this case you can see that bx plus a 
as the final terms in this model. It then also has terms for x to the 6, 5, 4, 3, and 2. But if we set g, f, e, d, and c equal to 0, then this model would be the same as that model. So that means that the linear model is nested within the polynomial model here. As it turns out, for nested models, if you add more parameters, you can always get a better fit. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get a better description. And this is what we call overfitting. You are fitting the noise instead of capturing the interesting underlying regularities. What does that mean? Well, this means that we would like to be able to select the model that has sufficiently many parameters that it gets an OK fit, but not too, so many parameters that we are now fitting the noise instead of capturing the regularities. So there's a trade-off. We need sufficiently many parameters, but not too many. How would we go about that? Well, it turns out that there are actually a number of ways in which this can be uh, approached using statistics. One manner it can be done is the so-called likelihood ratio test. And you may run into this from time to time in different uh, scientific contexts, including phylogeny, where it's used sometimes. The idea in likelihood ratio testing is that you are comparing a pair of nested models. One model has to be a subset of the other model. If you set some parameters equal to zero or to some other value, then you have to be able to make one model equal to the other. So in the case of nested models, you can compute their relative fit in the terms of this likelihood ratio. That just means you take the likelihood of one model, the probability of data given model one, and divide it by the likelihood of the other model, the probability of your data given model two. You'll notice that if this ratio is uh, greater than one, that means that model one has the better fit, it has the higher likelihood. Now, it turns out that if you compute the logarithm of the squared likelihood ratio, then this particular value, which we call delta, follows a chi-squared distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the number of extra parameters in the complicated model. I'll return to what this means. This means that if you can compute the logarithm of the squared likelihood ratio for some set of models, then you can compare that value to a chi-squared distribution with an extra degrees of freedom and determine whether the complicated model is significantly better than the simple model. The complicated model will always be better. It has more parameters and they are nested, so it will have a better fit. But the question we're asking here is, okay, but is it significantly better given how many additional parameters it uses? And that's what, what the likelihood ratio test analyzes. As it turns out, the logarithm of the squared likelihood ratio, the logarithm of something squared, you can move the two outside uh, up in front of the logarithm, the logarithm of a ratio is the same as the logarithm of the numerator minus the logarithm of the denominator. So this delta can be expressed in this form. Two times the log of the likelihood of model 1 minus the log of the likelihood of model 2. In the case of likelihood ratio testing, you can therefore ask biological questions in the following manner. You start out by fitting two alternative nested models to the data. These are the models you would like to compare, the hypothesis you would like to compare. For each of them, you write down what the optimized, the maximized likelihood was, and how many free parameters there were in each model. The goal is now to test if the parameter-rich model is significantly better than the simple model, than the null model, given how many additional parameters it uses. You do that by first computing this value delta, two times the log likelihood for the parameter rich model minus the log likelihood for the simple model. You compare this value to a chi-square distribution with an extra degrees of freedom. You look it up in a table or using your favorite statistics software. This will then tell you whether the complicated model is significantly better than the simple model. It will always be better, as I say, but this tests whether it's significantly better. If you get a sufficiently small p-value, you can say it's significantly better. Depending on the models you compare, you can, of course, ask different biological questions. For instance, you could ask whether are these sequences evolving according to a molecular clock. You would then compare a model with a clock and without a clock. You could ask whether or not you have positive selection. You'll see that uh, in a slightly different way in today's exercise. 
you could ask about differences in mutation rates among different sites. Should we use a gamma distribution or not to account for that, etc., etc. So depending on the two alternative models you compare, you can actually ask fairly interesting biological questions and use statistics to get an answer.